Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Canada Day to you all. Uh, it's good to see everyone. It just feels like you're a long way away, right? I know where, that's where the shade is, so I presume that's why you're all lining the perimeter of the lawn. Uh, either way, it's great to see you all. So open up your Bibles. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 11 in particular. If you didn't bring your Bible, you can probably pull it up on your smartphone or um, whatever you have with you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. We're looking at the final fruit of the Spirit today, and perhaps you recognized it, that consistent word between what Garth read in Galatians chapter 5 and what Norma read in 2 Peter. Today's fruit of the Spirit is, any guesses? Self-control, that's right, Atticus. But the fruit of the Spirit is all of those things and self-control. Against that, there is no law. This word is picked up in verse 6 of 2 Peter chapter 1. And it's actually the exact same word in Greek that's used back in the fruit of the Spirit list in Galatians chapter 5. It carries with it the meaning of mastering your passions and your desires. Okay, so when we're thinking about self-control, think about it in those terms. Mastering your passions and your desires. Now, if you and I look at our lives and at our world, we will see examples of self-control and examples of the lack thereof in many different places. I want to suggest just three simple ones as we jump in. The first one is to consider your life over the last 15 months or so. Ever since COVID restrictions began to take place and come at us in various ways, Perhaps you would look at your own life and ask the question, how did I spend my COVID time? Was it marked by self-control? I think for a lot of us, it was marked by unhealthy and unhelpful habits that crept in. These were functions of our passions and our desires that were not mastered. I know a lot of people who over COVID Notice that they were drinking too much out of boredom or looking for escape or for a savior. I know many of us ate too much and all the wrong things. That's why you've heard of the COVID-19, the COVID-19 pounds. It's a lack of self-control. I think another thing that has presented over these last 15 months was a massive spike in screen time somewhat out of necessity during the bad cold winter months. But you know how your smartphone gives you a weekly update of how many hours on average you spend each day on your phone? Right, this um, death scrolling social media. You know, Instagram has this new thing where um, if you scroll long enough, your Instagram will actually tell you you're all caught up. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Don't ask me how I know that. You can actually reach the end of Instagram. But that's, a, that's an unhealthy, unhelpful habit that has crept into many of our lives over this COVID lockdown. It's a lack of self-control. It's not what we want, but it's our passions and our desires that are not mastered. I think another way that we see self-control or a lack thereof is when you set yourself down to do a task. Now, some of us are more easily distracted than others. But have you ever tried to sit down and do something and you notice before long that even though you have the best of intent, you know, you've blocked off this time, you want to get this task done, um, you very quickly open a web browser and start checking your Facebook, right? You become particularly interested in some little known Cliff Clavin fact that you have to Google and search up. There's that person that all of a sudden you feel this overwhelming urge to pick up the phone and call them. This is um, what Freud and Jung would have talked about when they talked about how we navigate the internal discussions and dialogues that we have with our own self. We have a clear intent to do something. That's sort of our conscious mind. You want to sit down and you want to get that work done or the next thing on your to-do list. But somehow in your unconscious mind, in your subconscious mind, other things begin to take over and eclipse them. And, and in that sense, you and I often lack the self-control to stick with our intent. Our unconscious self vies for our attention. 
Another area that we see self-control is just in interactions on social media, okay? Social media is a platform that would benefit from some self-control. It's a revolutionary thought. If you see something on social media that offends you or triggers you, you don't have to respond. Did you know that? Right? You can just scroll past, let it go. We all know that social media is not a good platform for meaningful discussion or debate, and yet we see something on there that really just riles us up, right? And we are overwhelmed with the need to tell that person why they're wrong and why we're right. Well, that's a demonstration of a lack of self-control. You know, friends, as I've been reflecting on this over this past week, it struck me that most everything you and I would desire lies just on the other side of self-control. In this sense, even the things that are most difficult in your life, those things that you most deeply desire and you think how difficult they are to accomplish, they are, in fact, when you boil them down to their, their core dynamics, they're simple things The thing that makes them hard is the self-control and the discipline to make them happen and do them. Everything you desire and you want lies just on the other side of self-control. I'll give you two quick examples. The one is, if you wish to save money, the actual math of it is simple, isn't it? You just spend less than you make, and you will find that you save money. It's, It's not difficult to do, it's difficult to practice. It takes self-control. If you want to lose weight, right? You got to burn more calories than you take in. Step away from the potato chips. It's not, it's not complicated, but it's very difficult to do because it requires sustained self-control. A better life, a better family, a better community, and a better world are all unlocked by self-control. Men, this morning, if you are picturing your life and thinking, I really want to stop snapping at my wife and kids, that virtue is found by exercising control and mastery over your passions. Look, I want you to think about this for a moment. We started off by defining self-control as the mastery of your passions and your desires. If you think about how you live your life, would you say that you are bigger than your feelings or that your feelings are bigger than you? Think about it. Would you say that you are subject to your moods or your moods are subject to you? That's really the core question of self-control. Well, self-control is a universal virtue It's embraced in many different world religions and even in our secular culture. But the good news of the passage we're going to look at this morning is that Christians have a better way of getting there. Self-control is universally perceived as and valued as a virtue, but Christians have a better way of arriving at it. Because for us, we know that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Paul encouraged us in our passage in Galatians 5 to walk in the Spirit. And this is our last in this sermon series where we are looking at it and saying, how do Christians navigate tumultuous days? How do we deal with times that are unstable and uncertain like the ones we live in? And the answer is by walking in the Spirit, by allowing God to bear these fruit of the Spirit in our lives as we press ever more deeply into Jesus. All right, let's jump in, 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to move quickly through the verses, and then we're going to go back and pick out some gems, okay? So if you have it in front of you, look at verses 5 to 7. Here you see a string of six traits of the Christian man or woman. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with, what does it say? Self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. 
in these verses, you see this sort of cascading set of six virtues that ought to be added to our faith. Well, we're going to pick that up in a moment and unpack that. Look at verses 8 to 9. Peter says, For if these qualities, the ones that he's just listed, if they are yours, that's the first thing he's saying. He's saying as Christians, these qualities can be yours. If they're yours, and in the second place he says, and if they are increasing, then they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on and says, but if you lack these qualities, then you are nearsighted to the point of blind blindness. Verses 10 to 11. We see that self-control requires diligence. Peter says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These traits, including self-control, Peter says, require diligence. But he also says that when you see these traits in your life, they serve a particular function for the Christian. In those moments when you see self-control, that's in fact an assurance from God. If you see self-control in your life, for example, that's a reminder that you're a Christian because that's a fruit of the Spirit. That's something that God works in you. I mean, conversely, whenever you see people who lack self-control, you know, I, I used to coach football here at the high school and I remember one game in particular, our defensive coordinator absolutely lost his mind over a high school football game, right? This is like exhibit A of a lack of self-control. This guy like kicked over the massive Gatorade bottle. He was on a tie, he was just on an absolute raging um, fit. And I remember looking at him thinking, man, where's your self-control? And then I realized this guy isn't a Christian. Why would he be bearing the fruit of the spirit? Peter's saying that when you see these virtues in your life, it confirms your election and your calling. So when you see self-control, you know that you're reminded that you're a Christian. And you can't expect self-control from people in whom the Spirit of God is not at work. So that's the sweep of this passage. So now you're thinking, that's awesome, R.D. I came here on Sunday already bearing the weight of the world on my shoulders. And now you've just added all of this. On top of all of this, I need to add self-control. <laughs> Thanks a lot, R.D. One more thing on the checklist to do. But as you might suspect, that's not how it works. That's not how Christians arrive at self-control. Look at verses 3 to 4. Peter says, His, God's, divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us the precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. His divine power has given you everything you need for life and for godliness. What's contained in these first two verses of this passage are not commands, but promises from God. They're descriptions of what God has already done for you in Jesus Christ. And so here's the flow of the logic of our passage. Peter's saying, because of what God has already done for you in Jesus, because God has already looked after the biggest issues in your life, now you and I are set free to pursue godliness. You and I have been set free from trying to earn our salvation. That's been given to us in Jesus. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We don't have to bear that burden anymore. And so we can now point our lives towards the pursuit of these virtues. 
we can use our effort and our bandwidth to seeing these things furnished to our faith. Set free from trying to earn the biggest things in our life, we can now say, well, what am I going to do with my effort? If you look back at verse 6, Peter says, um, what does it say in this translation? Different translations handle it differently. Verse 5, for this very reason, make every, what does it say? Effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And then he goes down the list. Some translations would read and say, make every effort to add to your faith these six cascading virtues. But actually, the best translation of the Greek would be, make every effort to furnish your faith with these virtues. Think about that for a moment. What Peter's saying here, he's saying, God has already done everything necessary and needed for you, for life, and for godliness. And the good news is that that now sets you free to furnish that faith that is yours in Jesus with all of these virtues. Well, perhaps that's a new thought for you this morning. That the Christian life is composed of two things. The first is what God has done for you in Jesus, fully on the cross. Everything you need for life and for godliness. But that because of that, you're set free to pursue these virtues. Let me say it a different way. That the Christian life still requires and demands effort. That once you become a Christian, once you come to realize what God has done for you in Jesus, you're set free from trying to earn your salvation. Now you can pursue godliness. It's marked by swimming hard, not floating. Make every effort, Peter says, to pursue a good godly life. Think about how this works. Okay, let me give you two quick examples. The first one is... At this moment in human history, um, we are the beneficiaries of just this dynamic. So, so let me tell you what I mean by that. Back when human beings were primarily hunter-gatherer nomads, okay, we, we used up all of our energy and all of our bandwidth and all of our time and everything trying to eat, not get eaten, and procreate. That consumed everything that we had. Well, then human beings started to become agrarian. They began to settle down and plant fields. And all of a sudden, it became a lot easier to eat because you could plant crops and you could eat. Well, then they began to build things like fences and walls for protection. And so now you didn't have to worry so much about getting eaten all the time. And so what happened? Well, in very short order in human history, we went from being traveling nomads who were hunter-gatherers to putting people on the moon. Because our energy was set free from those other tasks, we could now focus on developing things like rocket ships and the internet. You see how that works? We've been set free from those day-to-day -day mundane tasks that were necessary. And so we can now spend our energy on things that are far more lofty. I thought of another example of this. For those of you who have children and you've been saving faithfully every month for their RESP. That's how that works too. You are looking after the financial burden so that your children, when they get into university, can focus their energy, their attention, their emotion, their effort, their bandwidth on getting good grades instead of having to worry about how are the bills going to get paid. That's why you save for them. You as parents are looking after these big issues so that they can focus on thriving in their studies. And if they're a wise, grateful kid, they will seize that opportunity and they will give themselves to diligent study. They will be grateful for the space that their parents have made for them to focus on the task at hand by looking after all these other responsibilities. So where does that leave us? 
Well, friends, that leaves us like those school-aged kids. God, in Jesus, has handed us the fattest RESP you could ever imagine. We no longer have to worry about things like our sin and our salvation and our eternity. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Now we can give ourselves diligently to the effort and to the pursuit of godliness. We can furnish our faith with virtues like self-control. Verse 3 shows us that we are free to pursue self-control because God has done everything necessary for us. All right, so we'll close with this. How do you pursue it? Well, again, in our passage, we're given the roadmap. You and I pursue these virtues, including self-control, these, these virtues of, of godliness. We pursue them by returning to and reminding ourselves of the promises of God. It's confidence in God's promises that plug us into God's power for godliness. Let, let me say it in another direction. If these traits, including self-control, are absent from your life, if they're missing, then they are an indicator light that you're not trusting in the promises of God. They're like the check engine light of your life. If you'd say, gosh, my life is just not marked by self-control, well, that's fine. Self-control is a virtue that you need to pursue, but it's also an indicator that you're not fully trusting in the promises of God. L let me say it a third way. The extent to which you and I put our trust in God's work for us and his promises to us is the extent to which we will see these traits like self-control grow like fruit in our lives. So the next time that you lash out at someone online, the next time you snap at your husband, wife, kids, whatever, the next time your passions run away on you, the next time you lack self-control, it's an invitation for the Christian man or woman to pause and remind yourself of the promises of God. In those moments when you lack self-control, you stop and you say, whoa, 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 hold on, R.D. You are truly and deeply loved by the God who has flexed his divine muscle to give you everything you need for life and for godliness. That's what's true about you. And even this moment where self-control is not being demonstrated, it's a moment of grace because this momentary loss of self-control is not wasted. It's a God-given opportunity for me to be reminded that I'm not resting in and trusting in the promises of God. And so return to the promises of God in Jesus. Remember that his divine power has given you everything you need for life and for godliness. And so you begin to actively furnish your faith and your life with these glorious Christ-like traits, including self-control. See, I think it happens, friends, in the Christian life when you realize just how safe and secure you are in Jesus. That everything in your life has been looked after by God. It's a kind of self-control that leaves no room for fear. Often people lack self-control when they are fearful. Well, Paul tells Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and love and self-control. When you return back to the safety and security that is yours in the promises of God, you will master those passions and those desires. You will furnish your life with godliness. This loss of self-control typically happens when you feel insecure, when you're uncertain about the outcome. But 
in interactions where the outcome is certain, it's easier to remain in control. If you go into an interaction, whether it's with someone you love or someone at work or someone online, and you already know that everything has already been achieved in Christ, you don't feel that insecurity that's going to force you to lose your cool. Instead, your self-control is rooted in the God whose divine power has given you everything you need for life and godliness. Let's pray. Father, you know that our tendency is to lose our cool, to forget that you've already done everything. Lord, would you even this morning remind us that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I pray, Lord, that you would bring us back to a place where we are so convinced that you've done everything needed for life and godliness that we can actively put our effort toward pursuing godliness and furnishing our faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.